Hello, everybody. I'm your host, and welcome to Securing Open Source Best Practices. My name is Mike Bizarre, and we have an awesome panel today. But first, let's get into some housekeeping. Uh, I want to direct you all your attention to the chat window on the right-hand sides of your screen. Um, this is where you can engage with us, ask questions. We'll be monitoring this during the course of the show. And then at the same time, we also encourage everybody to stick around because there will be some Amazon gift cards at the end. So the winners will be announced in the last you know, minute and a half, two minutes of the event. Let me introduce our panelists today. They are Peter Albert, who is CISO for Influx Data. Peter, welcome. Thank you. We also have Julius Mousseau, who is CTO for MergeBase. Julius, welcome. Hello. We also have Sherry Itzvazan, or Itzan, Director of Product for White Source. Hi, Sherry. Hi, everyone. And we have Florin Koada, who's a product manager for HCL AppScan. Hello, everyone. And then finally, we have Curtis Barker, Vice President of Product Strategy and Field CTO for Resilient. Hi, nice to be with you. All right, we're going to do something somewhat antiquated here, but we're going to do ladies first, and we're going to ask Sherry a question, which is, how serious or how big a problem is open source security right now? And I'm asking the question because I get there's a lot of vulnerabilities. However, a lot of folks in surveys are saying they trust open source software more than they do proprietary software. So what is the extent of the challenge or the issue right now that we're looking at? So this is definitely interesting. I would like to start with, you know, today you don't really have a choice in terms of, you know, business-wise, whether you will use open source or not, right? Let's put security aside for a second. Um, in terms of the business benefit it gives you, the velocity that it gives you, right? Everyone talks today about agility and how important it is to keep up with the market. This is one of the greatest enablers for that. So we just wanted to set like the scene that open source is like, you know, it's not even the future. It's, it's here and everyone uses open source. Even some companies that don't know they use open source, use open source. Uh, and in terms of the challenge or like the security threat in open source, so I think that like three or four years ago, someone asked me like, what is more um, dangerous, using my own code or using open source? And this is a question that rarely comes up now. There are a lot more vulnerabilities in open source, right? We usually see that the developers that are developing open source are sometimes less experienced. They don't get the right security training, which exposes us to vulnerabilities. On the other end, and um, we see that the community in open source is so much stronger. And almost every time when a security vulnerability is being published, I would say like 95% of the times, the next version would all already have the fix, which means that if you maintain your open source components up to date, which is not an easy thing, by the way, um, you are more or you are less um, in terms of getting, you know, yourself to a risk. So the downsides, of course, are I don't know who wrote this code. I don't know how well this is maintained. On the other hand, if you use um, components that are, you know, that are not deprecated or that are being well maintained, you can be pretty sure that if you secure yourself and if you make sure that you scan your code, etc., you will be safe by upgrading to um, a later version. I would say that for now. Um, but of course, there are a lot more parameters to how you secure your open source. But just in terms of setting the scene, I think that's more or less the, the basics of it. All right. Peter, I'm going to jump to you for a minute. Um, do you agree with that? Is open source less secure, more secure? You know, as a security fellow, how do you see this playing out on the uh, in production environments? Uh, it's, I mean, it's very contextual to how you're using the open source in your environment um, and also how much rigor you've put into evaluating the open source components that you're using. Um, so... I, I agree it's a pretty broad spread problem 
with a lot of complexity and a, a lot of scale. Uh, there's sort of a logical uh, interpretation, which is the more people who look at the code, the higher the probability something will get discovered and discussed publicly. Do you think that there's a kind of a flip side though, like a, a, an increased vulnerability there um, in that with open source, um, right, uh, a, a malicious researcher is more likely to find something good because, you know, they, oh, this is a very popular library. It's used in thousands of companies. Maybe if I just research it really deeply, I'll find a good vulnerability there. Like, do you think there's more exposure because of that? That that I that principle I think applies to all software. I mean, uh, I, I, if something's very popular, then a researcher, a malevolent researcher, will want to target that. Um, hmm. But getting back to the if it's open source and more people are looking at it, there's a probability that vulner vulnerabilities might be disclosed. That itself can also be a fallacy. Um, and I I wanted to cite the work of a researcher, uh, Ilya von Sprundel. Uh, and I believe it was 2018, 2019, he did some research on BSD. He looked at maybe 10 different distributions of BSD um, with the idea that this has been open source for a long time. So in theory, it should be pretty solid. But quite to the contrary, he found that since it was open source, there was an implicit assumption that it was secure. And he found hundreds of you know, non-trivial vulnerabilities across multiple distributions. Um, particularly if it's a large code base, you know, where if you've got seven, eight million lines of code in an open source package, like an operating system, um, you know, maybe there are some things in there that people just haven't gotten to really looking at and understanding. Florin, do you think that we're about to discover more of these because we had some software supply chain incidents We've had the Biden administration issue an executive order, and there's more people looking at their software supply chains and maybe discovering that they have all open source software they didn't know about before. I mean, to say that we're not going to find vulnerabilities, it's, you know, would be the, the end goal. I think that's the end goal of security, saying we'll never find them. I think we'll find more vulnerabilities. I think the important thing is how do we handle that and how do we work with the process of making that information known? And how do more people get into this space of, hey, let's help the open source community to get more information about their vulnerabilities. So let's supply them with the tooling to do. And we see some great initiatives that uh, are being started for open source, allowing them to find more stuff, giving them more tooling to use on their projects uh, from security tool vendors, from uh, development shops, making sure that open source gets the support it needs to go through that process of training their developers in some cases. And when we say open source developers, it's, it can be everyone, but there will always be a core of people that will uh, hopefully maintain a project. And yes, we'll, we will find more of them. Uh, we're probably going to have another big set of vulnerabilities coming over the next few years. Uh, which one were the big ones? The hardly, the shell shocks. Uh, we will get more. And uh, yeah, supply chain is adding some interesting twist where there's some more complicated attacks that could come through. But I have faith that we will, at some point, uh, overcome the problem. There will be some costs, let's say, along the way. Uh, some people will be caught off guard. But I do have faith that the open source community and these communities in general have that feeling of pride. And they do want to do their best work. They do want to put forward their best commitment, which is something quite interesting about open source and itself as a mentality. It's, it's a very interesting project. No one's forcing them to uh to do things no one's forcing them to uh kind of get invested into this software development but they do it out of passion and i think that will uh help them also focus more on security in the near future curtis do you agree with that because i've talked to some developers and their attitudes a little more uh shall we say uh less enthusiastic for what florin just said what their argument is is I built this fabulous software for you. It's free. It's open source. I did all these things, and now it's your responsibility. If you care to use it, I'm not making you use it to secure it. So where is the onus on the securing of the open source code supposed to be? Is it really with the developer, or is it with the people who are deploying it? It's with both, isn't it? Um, and, yeah, I, I think 
there's some studies out there that say that developers uh, participating in open source communities spend 3% or less time working on security uh, as, a, as a part of the development process for open source. So it is a small amount of time. I think the focus is about creating usable uh, functional code. Um, and uh, th there is a, a large volume. So even when we throw out numbers like that, it depends on the size of the project, the participants, uh, the, the follow-up, the velocity of, of development on any one particular project. Uh, I agree, they're very proud of you know, what they're doing, but is what they're doing is, is a focus security. And I'd argue in the past it hasn't been, I think it is more and more, but we can't take that for granted. Hence, um, organizations using um, uh, uh, code that is open source need to one, be able to identify that they are using open source code, open source packages within proprietary code, uh, and then to uh, understand, you know, where that came from. And I think um, the, some of the, um, the, the executive order that came through from the uh, Biden administration is helpful in that regard because it does require you to produce a software bill of materials and ensure the integrity of it via automated tools and then check for a, um, a remediate, uh, the remediation for potential vulnerabilities via an automated tool. So I think that leads um, organizations to be responsible for understanding you know, what code they have, what portion of it is open source, and then to check the integrity of it. Um, and of course, you know, we'd, we'd love um, these projects to focus more on security, but we cannot take that for granted. I have a funny anecdote about that, about, you know, um, you know, the, should the developer responsible or the end user um, be responsible to, or, you know, the person bringing open source into their org, where um, when I was at a credit union, we accidentally um, would send the full um, deployment off to Veracode, uh, which is a SAST tool. And so in a way, including all like 300 open source libraries in the product. And so Veracode was analyzing all 300 open source libraries every night looking for SAST issues, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, but, and so we would have like tens of thousands of these vulnerabilities that Veracode is discovering in, in the open source libraries, but we just, you know, we're too busy to even forward those to the open source libraries, right? It's just like a credit union trying to make sure the online banking is okay. It's kind of funny that, uh, you know, oops, we were accidentally running SAST scans against, uh, against the open source libraries. And I think that's, that, that, that is an interesting concept because we do see we do see people asking we do see end users kind of companies asking hey what if i do static dynamic on, on these libraries what can i get some information out of them oh. the challenge is is a lot of the tools will produce results but results need to be interpreted and i think that's where the community is really strong because if we just deliver this kind of information hey i scanned this open source library with tool x here's the results I, they might not have the means to be able to decide if those findings are real or not, and we're just adding more work to them. Uh, we have a bit of activity eh, on the Q&A, too, which is worth looking at here. But, sorry. Curtis was saying, you know, 3% of developers' time is spent on security, which is, which is good. But what we also have to take into consideration that there is a, an open source security community. There is a series of researchers and white hats and pen testers and I don't want to say that their goal is to break these things. They do like to see their name next to a CVE disclosure. They do like to be there and they do contribute a lot. And they don't do that for closed source projects. Uh, you know, research communities, you do see them working with closed source sometimes and they will disclose stuff. But uh, to what Chris was saying, all that, that there is a security community that's really, really passionate about finding things in open source as well. Yeah, and I'll sure. just add really quickly, to Mike, to what Florin said at the initial point. He said, uh, uh, and I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, uh, uh, Florin, validate um, the, the, the results. And that's really important. There, there are no end of um, uh, tools out there that will scan and produce vulnerabilities. Um, but to actually validate which one of the vulnerabilities are exploitable for the code that you're running for your particular application, I think that's really important because... Um, the, the reality is um, developers, security teams are already overwhelmed with the amount of security issues that they need to uh, fix generally. Um, so creating, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity to really validate which ones to prioritize based on the exploitability uh, and then having tools that will 
be very transparent around where the software, where the components came from, a mix of the two um, helps out a lot practically in terms of where you're going to uh, spend the time uh, to keep your application uh, protected. I definitely agree. I think that's, sorry, again, with the amount of open source vulnerabilities, like Mike, what you actually opened with, right? It's it's getting, we're getting more and more vulnerabilities and probably in the next few years, we're going to get more. Prioritization is critical. Like the idea of probably I'm not going to handle all of the vulnerabilities. I'm not going to resolve all of them just because an average application would have hundreds or thousands of vulnerabilities. And I need to prioritize based on what's exploitable, what's really effective, what's what kind of methods of the open source are being called my, by my proprietary code, um, what vulnerabilities are maybe found in transitive dependencies, and I can currently not act upon them. Um, and all these kind of things are definitely seeing things that we're seeing and handling. And I think that most of the tools are doing quite a good job today both in you know being able to determine which vulnerabilities need to be handled first as well as giving this a business priority right at the end of the day it's all about the business and in some applications the critical vulnerability can be really critical but in some even a low vulnerability is something that can harm my business. So it's really about like taking all of this information into account and making sort of, you know, a prioritization that is based on not only like the naive CVSS score, uh, but also about like my own business and how it affects that. I'd like to just uh, address Steve's questions on the, on the Q&A. Go ahead. Sure. Well, the first question, Steve, you asked, do you think using a binary repository loan could help secure open source? And I'm going to just have to say, I don't quite understand that question. Um, to be open source, the source code has to be available. So even if the artifact is available in a binary repository, the source code will still be available uh, in its, you know, in GitHub or wherever it's published. Um, I guess, I mean, a lot of open source li licenses like MIT or BSD or even Apache don't require the source code to be co-published, but nonetheless, it usually is. Your second question, Steve, is you tried to establish a use policy defining what components or source libraries, um, I guess, people could use in your company. And, um, but then developers uh, found it inflexible, right? And so of course, yeah, you're adding friction to the process whereby a developer can bring a library into the solution and, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, in many ways, that's going to improve things, but in, it's also going to bring development to a halt if a very useful library or framework is identified and, and then they suddenly have to throw it into some review queue internally that nobody ever looks at. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I've always been tempted by, by that question to be like, well, if the library is in Ubuntu or Debian, then you're free to use it. Because at least with Debian Ubuntu, there's like, there's a second layer, right? Like the Debian or Ubuntu maintainers at least are reviewing it. They're reviewing it for the license being appropriate, and they are also keeping an eye on security vulnerabilities. So it's kind of, that's kind of like a middle ground that I've always um, been attracted to. All right, Sherry, I want to follow up on that with you because we have a question from Christian, and it's kind of a similar idea. But um, a lot of times when you're a maintainer of an open source project, you're hungry for contributions from anywhere you can find them. But um, do we need to be more careful about who's making those contributions and have those people vetted be, in addition to looking at their code? And is that going to be a bigger issue? Because it seems like nation states are now trying to weaponize some of these open source projects. Yeah, so I think that that's a great question. And really, like we had a lot of discussions in the past. I mean, are we going to like completely, you know, give like a, a scoring like in GitHub for each and every one of the maintainers or the contributors and based on that say whether the open source is, is secure or not and all kinds of things. Also, one of the things that I heard in one of the previous webinars is like there is not enough money in open source and like some of the contributors are really working for like great companies and this is their motivation, right? They're contributing to open source, but they're not doing it, you know, voluntarily. 
but maybe you know giving some more uh, uh, means for developers to actually write open source would benefit in terms of the security. Um, I don't think we have the answer today. I mean, I think that definitely it's all about reviewing, right? The pull request and making sure that we have the right code review and the right maintainers. Also, as we mentioned before, the open source community is very, very strong. So you can assume, again, putting aside malicious packages and stuff like that, you can assume that if you know, a specific repository has enough downloads, enough commits, you know, enough forks, it's probably safe to use. Um, currently, I don't think that there is a good solution on actually verifying each and every maintainer, or each and every contributor to the open source, but I'm happy to hear otherwise again. Yeah. Well, Florian, let me follow up with you on that. You were talking a little bit about there's a, an open source community for security. And a lot of times it's vendors who are contributing code to these open source projects. If you delve into there, you'll find people from SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, AWS. So should those folks be devoting more of their resources to security? Because they have, at least the argument is, they have the skills to do that versus your average everyday contributor. It's a hard one to answer because saying that they should allow more time for security would imply that they don't. And a lot of the people that do contribute do kind of do the due diligence. So we'd like to encourage that. We'd like to see more people contributing more and helping more with security. But I don't want to say, you know, through my answer that they're not doing that already. It's something that's very hard to measure. Uh, one of the things that we constantly hear when you deal with static analysis is, how secure is the code that my developers write? And it's a hard thing to measure, right? It's a hard thing to monetize security when you do the right things because all of a sudden there's nothing to worry about. But we do hope that people that work from all aspects, you know, small companies, large companies, and do contribute to open source, do take some time to do some security, uh, do ask for help. And I think people at larger companies can potentially get some more help. Uh, they can get their own security research teams to maybe get involved in those packages. So we definitely want to encourage that, encourage, you know, research teams and uh, security teams to look into the open source projects you're contributing, see if there's anything there. And a lot of the times, if they are working for a large company and they are contributing to open source, I think it's fair to say the quotes that they are using those components. Uh, it, we've seen in the past, you know, the Red Hats, the IBMs of the world, a lot of contribution to open source, and they do actively use those projects. They do work with them, and they do do perform security research on them as well. But we want to encourage them. I don't want to accuse them that they're not doing it enough because I don't know the stats there, but we do want to encourage that as much as we can. I had a, a an open source library that I maintained just by myself for like five, six years. <laughs> the only patch I ever got uh, was from Red Hat, and it was fixing a security vulnerability. So kind of supporting Florin's uh, anecdote there. All right. Maybe we just need to get those guys a little more organized. Julius, we were talking about S-bombs earlier, and I wanted to get your opinion about something. It seems to me, at least in the age of containers, that the software is constantly being updated and we're ripping stuff out and replacing it. So the SBOM is, is it really descriptive of what's going on in there or can we continuously update that and does there need to be some sort of process for doing that? Well, right now, right, like uh, I believe if you want to sell software to the U.S. federal government, uh, you need to support SBOM. Um as a, as a vendor uh, selling into the U.S. government. Um, and I believe, you know, other companies and governments are going to follow suit on that if they haven't already. Um, so, I mean, there it really becomes a moment in time thing, right? Like, you, I guess you should be able to query any running application for its SBOM right in that moment. That should solve uh, that in, with all those constant updates. Another question, though, becomes, like, I mean, if you ask a a Docker image for its SBOM, it's, there's tools out there that will tell you all of the packages that are currently installed in that Docker image, like what version of Postgres, what version of SSH. But they don't look deeper than that, right? Like they don't go into the, um, the libraries of the individual, like, like of those systems, right? Because on a Docker image, I can type apt-get-installed-jenkins, 
And so now the Docker's SBOM is going to say, yeah, you've got Jenkins. But is it going to say that I have Guava, the Google library that definitely comes with Jenkins? So I feel like SBOM is kind of it needs to go deeper. Shiri, right. we talk a lot about shifting left. Um, do you think that a lot of these security issues are going to be uncovered as people build their applications using open source components during their DevOps workflow or DevSecOps workflow? And maybe we can lean more on the platforms to discover these issues versus the developer. Yeah, so I definitely think, again, that we don't, developers don't have to work in security, right? They have to, they need to develop applications, they need to do their job, they need to develop new features. Um, as a security vendor, my goal eventually is to minimize the time that developers log into the platform, handle security vulnerabilities. I want to do it for them. So everything that we can automate, we need to automate. And another important thing is that we need to integrate into their existing tool. And a great example would be like the repo, right? If I already write my code in the repo, in GitHub, let's say, and I'm doing a code review process and I just added a new open source library that added two vulnerabilities, this is something that should come up in the code review, right? It's my responsibility because I just added this open source component. Maybe I can look for another component. Maybe I can just upgrade the version that I'm using. But anyways, this is something that currently the developer needs to um, give the answers on. They need to be aware of it. Eventually, definitely, we wouldn't want it to be that way. We want, we would want that even, you know, as part of the research for adding a new open source component, I can see what vulnerabilities there are in it and then maybe have a better component that is more maintained, that doesn't have vulnerabilities. So this is like the extreme shift left. Um, Overall, I definitely think it's a process, right? So from, you know, people scanning in the pipeline, failing builds due to security vulnerabilities, which is something that is not very agile and very smooth, right? Because it stops everyone. Um, to the moment where we already find the vulnerabilities earlier in the life cycle, like as part of the research in the IDE, or even in the repo integration, that's even better. So yes, definitely. Um, Curtis, how smart are the tools gonna get? And I'm asking, cause David has a question here about educating developers. We also need to have the tools that will help us identify the library being used within a specific project. But it's not clear to me that even if I know the library that I know what the vulnerabilities are per se, or so you know, how do you, do you see this coming together? And how do you see, we hear a lot about DevSecOps, so I'm kind of asking you, what's the process going to look like? Yeah, a great question. And the, the tools um, do need to get smarter to some degree, or they, they, need to, um, they, they need to get more cohesive in the way they work together. Um, because a lot of the information, a lot of the tooling to solve these problems are out there. Do they all talk to one another? Are they all automated? Um, not necessarily, and I think that's what the market is demanding. And, and similar to, to you know, uh, Julius's comment about S-bombs, actually most S-bombs are manual today. People produce manual S-bombs, right? So um, we can do a lot better. Um, but when you think about, um, you know, to answer your question directly, yes, uh, the, the, pra the practice of um, dev secops and the automation you get with that um, is, is really important. There's still a lot of organizations, of course, with uh, fairly immature programs, but that shouldn't stop them. They should have a roadmap to try and embed uh, DevSecOps practices. And what um, studies see regularly is that um, organizations with more mature DevSecOps programs uh, are two to three times more likely to be using automated security tools and scan more frequently during the development cycle, which helps drive faster fix times. 
Um, so, you know, that's really, uh, really an important part of that as well. That the, the, the more you're doing it, the more it's part of your process, uh, the less technical debt you need to worry about as well, a reduction in technical debt. Most applications have flaws. There's a general buildup of security over time. So if you're building it into a process and iterating faster and more agile, there's less of that buildup. You can address things more quickly um, and uh, there's also, you know, a lot of studies that say if you don't address things in the first few months, that debt will stay there over time. Um, so building in uh, practices, um, you know, from a people process point of view, but using technologies uh, that can work together to provide the the, the right level of information um, is really important. And going back to SBOMs, that's a good good example. Most of them are not dynamic today, right? They 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 are a point in time snapshot. Uh, I think you know when you look at SBOMs to make them more uh, practical and usable in an environment that we're in now where code bases are regularly changed on a daily basis, sometimes uh, uh, many times a day. Uh, we need dynamic SBOMs um, that uh, reflect the code as it's changing over time. And to the question that was raised, we need um, some level of validation. It is helpful to validate of your SBOM what is in use as part of that SBOM, again, allows um, organizations to kind of prioritize. If I've got something in use and it's at risk, it's probably um, more important than the stuff that's part of the uh, code base but isn't used, number one. And two, if it's not used, do I need it, <laughs> right? So I think, uh, you know, there's a number of different benefits you can get there with that level of additional context around an SBOM, for example. Florian, let me ask you this. Um, I talked to some developers and they're inconsistent on their scanning at best. And part of the reason is they think they're going to write code and instead of scanning a small amount of code, they let it sit and then suddenly they've got this massive build at the end of the week somewhere that they're supposed to scan. And then it's going to take six hours to scan and inevitably it fails. Um, so is there some better, smarter way to think about scanning here? Is this really a people human issue rather than a tech issue? Well, I think it can be a bit of both. So to what Curtis was saying previously, uh, he was talking about automating and how automating is important and how that can help. But I think it's really important that we allow developers to become self-sufficient and we need to establish some level of trust between security and development teams. We're talking about DevSecOps, but realistically, we're looking at DevOps team that have a security person somewhere centrally, but doesn't those teams don't have any security capacity themselves. So to go back to your question is how they should be doing things if they're a smarter way to do things. One of the ways we've seen working quite well is enable development teams to have their own security specialist. You don't need someone who understands security at an advanced level. You just want someone who understands some security best practices. And then they can find the model that works for themselves. You know, they can scan it as they type their code or tools for that to help you find things immediately. Or you can do a scan at the end of the week different teams work in different ways and i don't think there is one solution that works for everyone uh, we've seen teams that are very efficient with dealing with security debt at the end of their release cycle so three months in they'll do their security scan but they know two weeks for me will be security nothing goes up before i finish this work but they're very efficient with what they're doing and the way they're doing it with uh, the one thing i would also mention here with uh, should i let things pile up my anecdote to this one is whenever you're doing security uh, you tend to think, hey, I'll do security three months in. But think about security issues like emails. If you don't answer emails for three months, there's going to be a lot of emails to go through to sort them out. And security will be the same. The longer you put it off, the more things will add up and you'll have to review. Tools will not produce 100% accurate results. Uh, one of the things I like to say is no tool will produce vulnerabilities. They'll come back with findings. Someone has to look at the findings. Surprise, surprise, security team will not have time for it because you're 3,000 developers and 30 security people. So that's where I think that uh, enabling development teams to have some security knowledge themselves and allowing them to set up a process and give them the uh, kind of the expectations can be quite efficient. If you tell them, here's the policy, I don't want to see any open source high or medium vulnerabilities. I don't want to see any high vulnerabilities coming from X and Y tool. I think you can be quite effective with that and they can find their own style. I would love to be able to sell a story of this is the perfect way to do it, but we've seen the story being changed in so many different ways by, by different people and works for them. 
Yeah. Well, Peter, let me ask you this because you're on the CISO side of the house, but what exactly should be the role of the security team in this conversation as it relates to developers? Because to Florence point, developers are out numbering security people 10 to one and security people have their hands full. So how do I bring these two cultures together? DevSecOps implies a different security model organizationally, which some companies call the distributed embedded model, where security engineers as Florin represented are embedded within development organizations. And there can still be a central security team that helps provide training, uh, oversight, and larger order programs. But you really need to have people within development um, and you need to educate developers. I think that's probably one of the most important controls that we found on the scale of the issue, what the tools are that are available uh, and what the life cycle should be when thinking about using open source and when receiving a report that there might be something wrong with it. I think as Curtis and others have said, there's a bit of analysis that has to occur to determine, you know, not only does a library have a CVE, but is the method within the library one that I'm using? And then ultimately, does that make it into the binary? Just because it's specified in code doesn't mean it made it into the binary. A lot of times things can get optimized out or changed. So there's multiple places in the delivery pipeline where introspection and observability is required. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, Curtis, can I ask a question as a follow-up? One of our attendees here is saying that his problem is that the security team doesn't want to be involved in setting up the policies or the best practices, so they've been kind of winging it. Are there places to go get policies that people can implement so maybe they don't have to wing it so much? Yeah, there are lots of um, guidelines on, um, you know, that will help inform policies uh, from, you know, the likes of NIST and, um, that might, uh, there, there are a bunch that, that, that look at Dev, DevOps and DevSecOps specifically. So there are guidances out there, but you know, any um, a practitioner in the space needs to take a look at what's going to work in their organization, get alignment, and then uh, try and drive uh, those policies. Um, and it would help if the security team uh, helped to uh, kind of rubber stamp and worked with um the, the the development organization uh, I'm, I'm surprised by the comment that the the, the security team are not partnering uh, with that organization that wants to create a security policy usually it can be the other way around that's what i've observed that the security team are trying to create a policy and then the policy for whatever reason is 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 problematic from um a, a business development perspective so the fact that whoever's in this security team um, they've got a, a, a willing audience that wants to work with them on a security policy. It, it feels like, you know, uh, Christmas come early. They should take full advantage of that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, there are there are numerous places where you can get guidance. But actually creating a security policy that's going to work in your organization, that needs to, it's going to take some curation. All right. Well, speaking of that, we have another question from Christian, and I see that Florian I, playing yeah. around with it, so it's going to him. Um can add something to what Curtis said and to sure. one of the things we've seen being quite effective with this, there is often the question of who's responsible for security. And one of the things we've seen, one of the security people we've been working with was having a different problem. Developers would not respond to the policy they said was, okay, it's a simple job. We're going to go to the next person up and we're going to say who gets fired if we get hacked because we don't have this. And the answer was simple. Do you have a security policy? Yes. Security is good. Do you provide them with the tool and the education? Yes. Developers, are you signing up to be responsible for those guidelines that have been done given to you? And they're like, uh, well, it's not our job to secure things. Obviously, the, <laughs> the management disagreed, and that was a, a simple break. But always ask them, who's responsible for it? If they're saying they're not responsible, fair enough. Take it up to the next person in the chain and make them uh, kind of do that split. Make them make a, do a judgment for you. You right. should, if you want to do security, you should be very, 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 you know, clear about it that you want to do it. I don't think it happens often enough that developers want to do security. We should encourage that by all means. 
go to the next person up in the chain, escalate. You should be allowed to do security. You should be enabled to do security. Well, follow up on that with our next question from Christian, who uh, wants to know more about AI. So how far can I kick the can down the road? Can I kick it all the way to an AI that's going to take care of all this stuff someday? Or you know, can this save us from ourselves? My favorite story about security is a tech company that thought we're, we're going to build an AI agent to help us with quote quality. Does anyone want to guess the outcome? It did to their code what Skynet planned to do to humanity. They basically deleted the entire code base. Uh, <laughs> there are ways you can use AI for code security. Absolutely. I think there is a lot of different technologies and a lot of different vendors leveraging this out there. Uh, for static analysis, my engineering team has been using AI to help us discover new ways of tracing code through the applications. I think in some other cases, people use AI to recognize what an effective fix would be for you because they can see other people doing that through open source. You know, going back to that open source, they can see through the pull request what was done. Uh, it, AI is just another tool in the box. I don't know if it's the end goal for it, but people are definitely leveraging AI at the moment. Uh, there's different creative ways of using it. Uh, and results can be quite impressive at times. And if you are um, if you are happening to launch or found a, a cybersecurity startup, um, if you can somehow inject some AI into that a little bit, it does uh, help attract investors and improve your valuation. <laughs> All right. Well, Sherry, yeah, let me ask you something here. Um, you've you've got to be really really careful. Just to follow on from what Julius <laughs> and Florin are saying, is that in a in a fast paced DevOps environment where code changes. Uh, and code changes in your code base frequently, the model which AI is taking a, a, a viewpoint to uh, then inform their dis its decision-making process, it, it's changing very quickly. And when you've got a, uh, a model, uh, a data lake that is rapidly changing, uh, AI can be very inconsistent, right? If you've got a, a stable data lake, um, and then you can use that as a way to inform decision-making process. That's useful. But in a very dynamic environment, uh, one of the reasons why we've seen probably less AI than in, for example, the XDR space, um, where there is a, a, you know, a bigger data lake, um, is, is because of precisely that. When I've seen um, vendors use AI for things like preventative measures or detection, there's lots of false positives because in a dynamic environment, things change too quickly. And then to follow up on one question raised uh, by William um, um, here in the chat around containers um, that come with a lot of open source component that contain vulnerabilities. Uh, my organization did some testing um, on, uh, again, the most, uh, the, the, the top um, containers used in, about in the Docker repo. And a lot of them do have vulnerabilities. Um, significant amounts of vulnerabilities. What we uh, were able to um, test and validate was that only 30, um, sometimes only 20% of them are actually exploitable, meaning that when you use those images, the, um, the vulnerabilities associated to those packages, those packages are not used. They're, they're not in use. Um, they're part of the, the, the file that it comes with, but they're not actually in use by that uh, Docker uh, image. And, and that, that's why it's really important to validate if the uh, image that you're using, um, validate if the vulnerabilities are exploitable, if they're gonna be uh, run it, running through memory or not. And if they're not running in memory as part of the uh, runtime execution, then they're not exploitable, right? So that validation can save a lot of time and help you have a much better baseline of risk. One problem with that, though, like if you look at the Equifax Struts uh, disaster, in that case, the the library is just sitting on disk, right? It was never in memory. The problem was that the attacker could compel the library to load and then and then uh, attack through that. So the, the actual vulnerability was never used. It was only the attacker that was able to compel it into it being used. Yeah, but that's that's a great point. Uh, so you will have scenarios like that, which is why it's important to have a dynamic, um, you know, S bomb or anything that's scanning to have it scanning dynamically. Because what you're saying is um, there was a scenario where something not in use was um, um, uh, provoked 
or yeah. invoked to be in use. But yeah. once it once it is in use, it then is it can be marked as loaded. And if it yeah. was loaded, it can be loaded. And if it has been loaded, you should mark that as something that is risky mm. and then treat it um, accordingly. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. There are techniques like that out there, uh, which is why having a dynamic um, um, uh, process monitoring what actually is executed in memory is really important. Sherry, is there some way to cut down the number of alerts being generated without maybe getting into AI? I mean, a lot of people may not be ready. So, yes, and this is, I think, one of the things that is something that I deal with, like, on a daily basis. Like, how do I reduce the noise? How do I make sure? Because if there are so many vulnerabilities, no one is going to treat them, right? If you open your uh, your alert screen and you see, like, thousand, you're not going to do anything because you're going to say, okay, it's not going to happen. It's not going to help anyway. Um, so the ways that we currently use to reduce the load again is identifying what vulnerabilities are effective, being called by your proprietary code, which is not an AI technology, it's an algorithm, but it's there and it can be used. Um, of course, making sure that your dependencies are up to date all the time. So every time there is a newer version of the open source component, make sure to use that. And Say on that, um, Sherry, with that, though, with yes. always making sure you're on the latest and greatest, right? Like, then you're vulnerable to those other attacks, like event stream, where the, the poisoned package gets, gets released. So what do you do about that, then? Yeah, so I think it's a combination. Again, it's not just having one of these tools and that's it. It's also about maintaining, you know, making sure that you don't have and blocking these kind of malicious packages. We also use... You know, like data and crowdsourcing technologies to understand that sometimes it's not good to use the latest version, right? Sometimes the latest version was not adopted by anyone and you are the first one going to use it. You would probably not want to use it, right? So seeing that data, seeing what is the confidence of the marriage that you are going to do is also a very important thing. Knowing whether other GitHub repositories already adopted this change, but they rolled back is a great signal for, okay, I don't want to update to this version, even if it solves a vulnerability. So having this kind of data really reduces like the noise and also reduces the risk. Um, so these are just two small things that we can do in order to eliminate or you know make sure that the number of alerts is smaller again this is a great question and i think this is definitely something that security tools will need to um will need to address right it's not only about showing you the report with these are all vulnerabilities even there if there are zero false positives which by the way in open source the situation is very good i mean it's not like static analysis where you have to review the results and there are a lot of tools out there that are sometimes you know you have to work and make sure that you fine-tune the results with open source it's it's pretty easy this is why it's also considered by a lot of people as a quick win right you go through the results there are usually they are usually accurate and you fix them of course it's not that easy um, but this is another difference between you know proprietary code and open source. Yeah, to, um, I don't know if every, everyone's quite catching that, but uh, in a way what that what uh, Sheree's saying, I believe, I might be mis, mis paraphrasing, is SEA tools are nice. Like So like white source and merge base, for example, as, as SEA tools and Florin has an SEA tool as well, in that they tend to just not report as many vulnerabilities, whereas SAST tools, uh, um, static analyzers just drown you in alerts. like tens of thousands of alerts, whereas SCA tools tend to really just focus on vulnerable library versions. And so they don't drown you like that. Absolutely. One of the advice I always give to my clients is decide what you want to do and focus on doing static analysis on your code and SCA on third-party code. You can do SCA on third-party code. Do you want to do it? If you're a security researcher, yes. If you're a developer trying to secure your, your stuff, Probably no. Uh, you have to validate things. And if you don't understand that code, it's very hard to do. Uh, we've seen developers being quite effective at becoming security champions through static analysis. 
uh, because they kind of start getting into the mindset of, hey, data comes from this place. It's a user input. It goes to this place. It's a database. Am I seeing any form of protection in the middle? And is there any sanitization happening? So we've seen these tools being effective, static analysis, in training developers to think more like a security person. But convincing them to do it can be a challenge at times because there is a bit of work you have to do. And nothing applies more than the email story to security than static analysis. If you don't do it for three years and you start, you'll be busy for a while, but you can get there. And these are places where AI can help. Uh, there are some smart ways of dealing with the data that can help. But as always, you know, it does require some effort to get there. And my firm belief is that no tool will ever report vulnerabilities at this point in time, they will report findings. It's up to you how do you fine tune the tooling and how you create your own funnel to get to the things you care about. I think there's an opportunity there also in the uh, contemporary software development pipelines where there there is typically a kind of a peer code review step, which more traditionally is done for things like stylistic and functional reviews. So taking advantage of the existence of a manual code review opportunity by offering focused training to developers by security researchers on what they look for when doing manual security code reviews, just to have that baked into the knowledge of each developer. Then when they go to do that manual peer code review, they might have a higher probability of, of discovering something that's, that's worth discussing. Yeah. Hey, Peter, Christian is asking if the bad guys are starting to use AI for penetration testing and to discover code, and are we involved in something that might feel like an AI arms race? I believe that's been happening already for some time. <laughs> All right. So is there... AI is a tool like everything else, right? It's a stepping stone towards automation. The purpose of AI is to remove some of the noise from us, declutter some of the things. But at the moment, personal belief, uh, AI is not the final answer answer to it. It's just another tool we have in our toolbox. And, you know, I think Curtis raised a good point that AI has to be trained and training AI is not always easy. Uh, tr AI can become biased if you don't train it properly. So as always, we still have responsibility to do things, but AI can be a very efficient stepping stone towards getting in a more secure place. Peter, let me I, follow up with that. Do you think there might be a backlash against open source because of security concerns? No, no. no. I uh, yeah, again, like I, I, I have a hard time ultimately drawing much of a distinction there between the use of open source or enterprise. If if you're using someone else's code, there's a possibility, if not a probability, that there's there's something in there that you should know about from a you know, hygiene perspective. Whether or not it makes it into an exploitable situation is a whole other story. All so right. yeah, I don't I don't think open source will receive any any type of backlash other than what you know third party software in general is receiving. I, I think going back to was it Richie who said if you didn't write it you can't trust it? Um, right. Ultimately, um, ultimately. Yeah, if it was, okay. Well, uh, mm -hmm. he's made a mistake uh, there. <laughs> I, I, can't, I don't even trust my own stuff. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that comes on to a question. I'm going to go around to everybody and ask this following question, starting with Shiri. Okay. Are you optimistic or somewhat pessimistic about the state of open source security right now? I think I'm very optimistic. Again, I think it's all about risk management, right? Like what is the value that I get out of open source versus what is the, is the risk that, I, that it poses on my organization and how do I manage that risk? And I think that we can definitely see in terms of just in general, like the velocity that it gives to enterprises and to organizations in general, the ability to open new businesses, new startups, just, you know, with that code that you already have um, and leveraging open source is just a great thing that we have. And I think that with the involvement of new security tools and existing security tools to be more automated and more even like invisible for developers, um, we can definitely like continue and leverage open source. And I think 
I definitely think open source and the open source community is a great thing and um, and it enable, enables us just so much. All right. Anybody feeling pessimistic about the future of open source security? We, we, we have a um, all right, open source is humans sharing knowledge with each other. So, you know, we just have to get a little more rigorous and responsible when we use it in critical situations. I also think we need to be ready, if you kind of look at this picture behind me, uh, for another cataclysmic open source event like Equifax Struts. I think it's inevitable. Um, is it going to be in a year? Is it going to be in three years? Is it going to be in five years? And that kind of leads to David's question. Hey, like, what should I do about uh, remediation times, right? And so, you know, get ready. There's going to be a really bad one in, you know, maybe in three years, maybe tomorrow. And use uh, the current vulnerabilities that are getting um, raised in your in your systems as an opportunity to practice and and to really get that remediation time down All right. and also to david's question just to uh, i like uh, uh, peter's suggestion in, in the um to normalize the, you know the, the difference between there is a difference between proprietary or commercial code and obviously uh, open source but from a development perspective of how you build your services and application stack uh, to normalize practices around them, uh, to have uh, diverging practices for open source versus uh, commercial uh, versus proprietary, um, I, I think you're, you're setting yourself up for a, a process and potentially a management nightmare. Um, so if you can normalize as much as possible um, a, a practice for all of every everything that makes up your code base and the stack that you build your services on uh, and that's kind of in response to to david uh, uh, david's question curtis millions of dollars is being allocated to help secure open source so that's not a bad thing but i guess my question is are we ever going to be done or are we always going to be spending millions of dollars on this I think we're going to be spending a, a bunch of money for a long time because we're digitizing. It's not, yeah. I mean, it's we are we are moving forward on this digital journey full steam ahead. Um, so, uh, in correlation with that, I expect you know to to Julius's point, more struts, um, an acceleration of the incidence of of these attacks. Um, but with that, I, I I think we'll get more adept to dealing with them. Uh, and that investment, I think, now early stage, as people are taking on the 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 you know, taking on the even large organizations, they're taking on the risk that comes with using open source code. I think it's worthy a worthy investment. Do you guys all seem to agree then that it might get worse before it gets better? Or there's going to be this cataclysmic event. Everybody on board for that, or are we going to get lucky? It's not a question of if; it's always a question of when something else will come up. But will it be cataclysmic? It's hard to say. There have been a lot of vulnerabilities that kind of did put us to a test. But I think transparency, uh, admitting when you've made a mistake, like every everything else, uh, will probably get us a long way. And I think if the worst happens and you've done the best you could have done, I don't think anyone will expect that uh, you should have done more. That's that's just the way I see it. It's it, Something will happen. Just always be transparent when it happens. And... Do whatever you can to make it better. In, in human society generally, Mike, I'd, I'd put it like this. In human society generally, a distributed model is always better than a centralized model yeah, in terms yeah. of risk mitigation. Right. Julius, last question goes to you. Do you think that there's a difference between the quality of security that I might see in a small open source project versus a large one? Or do you think the bad guys are aiming for the large ones or are they aiming for the little ones that they know they can get into? Hi, I'm going to have to pass on that question. I just don't have insight into that. But if um, maybe uh, Shiri um, would like to answer that one. So again, I think it's the idea is more about processes, I believe, than anything else, right? In this model, like to to the question before, like is it better to have something that is centralized or distributed again it's i think it's all of the above and uh, but i definitely think that if we if we have the right processes in place and if we have the right tools and the right culture we can solve more or less everything all right awesome guys we're running out of time here i want to get to our winners there are 
Philip B, Shiva R, Christian S, and Michael B. Congratulations for all winning an Amazon gift card. I want to thank our speakers for sharing their knowledge and insights today. That was awesome, folks. And to all you attendees who have spent your time with us, we thank you yet again. Everybody have a great, safe, and secure day. Thanks, all.